Ladies and gentlemen, young and old, this may seem an unusual procedure, speaking to you before the picture begins, but we have an unusual subject. Without Mr. DeMille, there would be no Hollywood. He was a monument. He was an institution. He was more than just a director. He was an indelible part of American culture. I don't think he had an original bone in his body nor an original thought in his head. The most successful filmmaker in the history of movies. A very fakey director. One of the best. He was like a split personality. Really an amazing man. He was a hard man to get along with. An easy person to be around. He was a showman. An icon. Ginormous. He was a tyrant. A heroic. Charming. Sadistic. God. January the 21st, 1959. News of a death echoes around the world. The end of a life of biblical proportions. A man who aroused enormous difference of opinion, a thoroughly bad director, or the greatest showman on earth. He was an opera maker. With DeMille, it was going to be a colorful explosion of imagery and a a extras and spectacle and Egypt and the Philistines and the this and the that. You know, it was going to be uh, more than your money's worth. And that's all people really cared about. They wanted to get more than their money's worth. And C.B. DeMille always delivered on that. Oh, DeMille again meant for me I was going to see a real movie. I wish I could put an image up there like DeMille could. I don't think I can. The career of Cecil B. DeMille spanned half a century and 70 films. As one of the founders of Hollywood, he created the studio that became Paramount Pictures. And the filmmaker was even more famous than his films. Quiet, quiet, <laughs> quiet. We're trying to take a scene here. Now keep quiet and attend to your business. On the set, C.B. was like a king. He sort of loomed above the set like the deity, you know? He would get on a boom and he would be up there on the boom, looking down like Jehovah. What's that girl doing over there with a 1935 headdress? You know, this isn't a fantasy, this is history. If things didn't go well, DeMille could rant and rave. He wanted a result. He wanted excitement. He wanted drama. Looks as though she just walked out of a beauty salon. And he was a little bit like an Alexander the Great, the way he spoke. He was like a great battlefield commander. You felt you were in the presence. He demanded absolute attention, and uh, he ruled the set with an iron hand and an iron voice, I might add. There was a guy that just followed him with the chair. That was me. Just followed with the chair, and when he sat down, that chair better be there. <laughs> there was another stooge, you might call him, who walked along with two megaphones, a small one or a big one if he was talking to a big crowd. And that fella better be right there on time. And he had such discipline on the set, and they had a scene out in the ocean, and he was looking for a shot, and he looked through his finder, and he walked towards the water, Mitch Lyson and Ann, and Hezzy Tate, his assistant, and all the people, and they, there were about eight of them, and he started walking, he walked out into the surf, and all eight of them went right with him, up to his waist, and he's still looking, and they're all up to their waist, and they kind of had not a damn thing to do with the finder, he's just looking, but they all, he might put out his hand. 
I wasn't there because he didn't need a chair. C.B. himself, I think, was thoroughly and totally and completely detested by everyone who ever worked for him until they got to know him. Ready, action, camera. New York, 1913. America is a second-class power. Much of the land west of the Missouri has yet to be settled. The slogan, the land of the free, acts as a magnet for immigrants. These masses from the old world, desperate for work, are almost as desperate for cheap entertainment. All over the immigrant quarter, Nickelodeons have been springing up, showing short and primitive films. This is the theatre district, where one or two showmen are daring to present longer, more dignified films imported from Europe. The name DeMille is up in lights on Broadway, but it's that of Cecil's older brother William, a successful playwright. When the two collaborated, William was the dominant partner. His little brother Cecil, of course, tagged along, and he was not so successful. In fact, he was really a failure in everything. He tried, but the two men wrote plays together, and um, Cecil acted in a lot of them. Cecil Blount DeMille was born on August the 12th, 1881, at Ashfield, Massachusetts. His father was destined for the church, but his mother diverted him to the stage as a far more powerful pulpit. They worked with a great impresario, David Belasco. Belasco was a man who uh, uh, was sort of the king of American theater in a way. Um, he had his hand on the pulse of the American public. He knew what they wanted to see. He produced extraordinary spectacles, uh, very lurid and uh, pulp almost, pulp theater in a way. It would present uh, theater that was um, quite a show. I think certainly DeMille comes out of that tradition. Belasco used to come to the house. Grandfather cherished the visits because Belasco would come wearing a cape bearing presents, very flamboyant. Grandfather always said, I just wanted to be like him. But by 1913, Cecil B. DeMille was desperate. He had made no money as an actor, no money as a producer. He had a wife and child to support, and thanks to the movies, the bottom had dropped out of the popular theater. Everything changed one historic day in 1913, when three friends, Jesse Lasky, DeMille, and Sam Goldwyn, met to discuss their future. Jesse Lasky and I had become very close friends and they threw his work in vaudeville. We had a play that failed and Jesse said, what should we do now? And I said, let's go down to Mexico and join the revolution. And Jesse said, no, if you want excitement, let's go into pictures. And I said, all right, let's. Cecil admitted that he'd never seen a picture before and didn't know what it was all about. I said, don't let that worry you, Cecil. I will arrange for you to go up to the Edison studio and stay there for a week, and you'll see exactly how it's done. Cecil did go up there, but he stayed only one day. That night, he phoned me, and he said, Sam, if this is how they do it, I'll be knighted in one year. The mill set off in search of locations for his first film, a long film. The Lasky Company had the vision to make a feature, unlike the shorts their competitors were making. For his film, the mill needed mountains, farmland, the open range. By chance, he arrived in this little town, founded a few years earlier as a vice-free utopia of Christian values. Free land was offered to any denomination willing to erect a house of worship. The place had a picturesque name, Hollywood. DeMille arrived in late 1913 full of enthusiasm, but he found facilities were meager. He rented space at this studio on Vine Street, a recently converted barn. Cast and crew line up on the open-air stage for the first day's work. DeMille co-directed with an experienced film man because he knew so little. But he was sharp. Ooh, that, and energy. That was a young man with the real... Conquistador's energy. He was out to get ahead. DeMille's film, taken from a Broadway hit, was about the love of an Indian girl for a white man. While other long films were stage-bound, 
De Mills at least had a feeling for location. Making Hollywood's first feature, he was not only taking a risk, he faced determined opposition. De Mille was an independent, a dangerous thing to be. The established film people would stop at nothing to keep these newcomers out. Mr. De Mille had a few encounters with a pistol, someone shooting at him when he was riding his horse down Vine Street. Also, some of the film was burned set on fire. Despite all the setbacks, the Squaw Man was an enormous success. DeMille's brother William was so impressed, he abandoned Broadway to join the studio. The Squaw Man consolidated the Lasky Company. They hoped to make a feature a month. At the Lasky Barn, which is still standing, DeMille built up the studio from scratch. He had the title of Director General. He was in charge of all production. In this office, at this desk, he supervised the output of a studio which quickly became one of the most influential in Hollywood. There was great excitement and great fervor and great sense of romance, romantic adventure. They didn't know what they were working in. They didn't know what the future would be. They didn't know what they were doing. They knew that every picture broke boundaries. Some one new thing would be done, a new way of handling the camera, a new way of cutting, a new way of lighting and they'd be so excited by it. By 1915, he had showed extraordinary energy. He directed something like a dozen feature films. He wrote screenplays for 15 films. He supervised the production of, of four or five other directors on the lot, literally working 18, 20 hours a day, sometimes working day and night on his own pictures as well as others. He had tasted failure, and he wanted to make a success in this new DeMille was not afraid of tackling controversial subjects. This film of slum life was social comment with a vengeance. The husband shows his wife the squalor to put her off having children in the slums. This scene at a garbage pail led Variety to say, it is enough to cause one to become ill in viewing it. For sheer shock value, few films could match the cheat. Seshua Hayakawa plays a wealthy Japanese art collector. He lends money to a society woman, expecting favors which she refuses to grant. This used all the techniques he had learned from Belasco, decor, lighting. To these, he added the formula he would use for the rest of his career, sex, sadism, and lurid melodrama. Mill stamped his films with his own distinctive style. Right from the beginning, he made his personality familiar to the public. Here he is on the left in a prologue for his second release. And he sought to create a unique look for his films. Inspired by the Belasco lighting style, he and his cameraman, Alvin Wyckoff, opted for the strongest possible effect. One of our executives called me up in a rage. If you're only going to show half the face, he said, people will only want to pay half the price. I told him, if you haven't got sense enough to know Rembrandt lighting when you see it, it's not my fault. Oh, he replied, is that what it is, Rembrandt lighting? Oh, they'll pay double for that. 
<laughs> Were you influenced by the earlier filmmakers? The earlier filmmakers? Well, there really weren't any earlier filmmakers. Yes, there weren't. <laughs> <laughs> but towering above all other filmmakers was D.W. Griffith, who had made an epic of the Civil War. DeMille saw Griffith's birth of a nation transform the industry and lead to the building of picture palaces to show such epic feature films. Griffith is my number one director. I think The Birth of a Nation was perhaps his best picture, but he gave something more valuable than all of his pictures, or all of mine. He was the first one, and the one who taught us all, to photograph thought. That is to bring a camera close enough to photograph the expression of the eyes. DeMille was rising fast as a rival to Griffith. One of his finest films was this, made incredibly at the same time as The Cheat. He shot The Cheat during the day and he shot The Golden Chance at night. The Cheat is the picture that he got all the international acclaim for. The Golden Chance is probably his greatest picture, at least to my mind. It's uh, the one true masterpiece of, of that period in the teens. A girl from the slums is being used to entrap this rich playboy, played by Wallace Reed. She finds herself falling in love. That night, by chance, her burglar husband breaks in. DeMille had built a strong reputation with films mostly on an intimate scale. D.W. Griffith was at work on another monumental epic, Intolerance. He rebuilt the ancient city of Babylon with sets which soared above Hollywood. Not to be outdone, DeMille launched his own epic. This was the first of the grand spectacles the public would forever link with the name DeMille. Joan of Arc was played by the great opera star, Geraldine Farrar. DeMille would enhance the realism of the burning with a color process which he pioneered. Despite objections from the Catholic Church, Joan the woman was well received, but failed to make a profit. Even though DeMille's contract called for one big picture a year, his new boss, Adolf Zukor, who had now merged with Lasky, refused to approve them. The two men had a wary relationship. America had now entered the war. DeMille was asked to join stars like Chaplin, Fairbanks, and Pickford in selling Liberty Bonds. DeMille tried to join the army, but was turned down. Instead, he formed the Lasky Home Guard from his actors and technicians and drilled them on the back lot. He himself was captain, naturally. He had no right to be, but he just was. He had gone to military school as a young man, so he knew something. And I think he read up on his manual of various things and he commanded them, and then they had a final drill out at the Lasky Ranch. Mary Pickford presented them with their colors, and I remember Mrs. Pickford saying she'd had it all made of silk, 
the finest silk and all the stars were hand embroidered. Cecil, when he said goodbye to the boys, his voice broke and he was really overcome with it. Mary, however, like a little soldier, stood up and sent them to death very valiantly. The sinking of the liner Lusitania by a German submarine in 1915 had outraged America. DeMille recreated it. The sequence brilliantly contrasts the brutal efficiency of a German submarine crew with America's innocence, symbolized by Mary Pickford. By outraging the audience with German brutality, DeMille hoped to mould public opinion, driving them further into the war. There is one of the most interesting things in that picture that I have ever seen in my 45 years of picture making. We had a German shell strike a church. The walls parted and were blown to pieces, and the crucifix was left standing. Now, that was not planned. That happened all by itself. But it was one of the most dramatic things I have ever seen. Too old for the army, DeMille was not too old for the Air Corps. He took flying lessons so he could go to Germany and shoot down the Red Baron. And uh, they called off the war and he didn't get to do it. Uh, well, if he had gone there, he would have tried to shoot down the Red Baron. His enthusiasm for flying led to his creating one of the first passenger airlines in the United States, Mercury Aviation. His airfield was in the heart of Los Angeles. One of the most extraordinary of all stunts was staged here. A plane-to-plane -plane transfer was being filmed. The stuntman tries repeatedly to climb to the other aircraft. He is dashed against the wing. DeMille kept this footage in his private archive. Incredibly, no one was injured. But Adolf Zuko was terrified at the risk his director general was taking by continuing to fly. DeMille had to choose. I knew there were better flyers than I, he said, but directors? Well, you can draw your own conclusions. DeMille threw himself into his work more furiously than ever, determined to raise the new art to new heights. I saw him directing, and he had the most tremendous energy of anyone I've ever known. He was himself so tremendously, you know, it's a bull, a young bull. I always feel, felt I had to give an absolute reason for being a woman, for being alive, for being there for occupying air space. By now, DeMille was capable of tackling any subject, but his most remarkable film to date was a dark drama ahead of its time in what was termed thought photography. The leading character steals from his employer and is desperate to conceal the crime. He finds a corpse in the river. Batters it beyond recognition. Gives it his identity. And ends up in jail for his own murder. On death row, he is haunted by his inner voices. It was the first psychological drama. It was not a big success financially. The picture was released at a time when uh, 
It was the darkest hours of the war for us. People didn't know really just how, how to receive it. The end of the war brought the start of the Jazz Age. Audiences clamoured more than ever for escapist entertainment. With the European industries crippled by the war, Hollywood was now the film capital of the world. Its studios were expanding. Lasky and Zucker had made their paramount trademark universally celebrated, and their most valuable asset was Cecil B. DeMille. For the new markets, DeMille would have to turn away from the dark dramas that meant so much to him. From now on, he would be ruled by the box office. He would let the public peer into a private world. No one else was showing such intimate moments on the public screen. B.B. Daniels in Why Change Your Wife with Thomas Meehan. DeMille's sex comedies start at the point where other films leave off. These were extraordinary films at the time, again, the explored areas that, that had just not been explored in films and, and, and very little in theater as well. DeMille's subtle approach to these marital films would have a strong influence on other directors. In this respect, he would overtake even D.W. Griffith, whose current films seemed unable to speak to the new generation. Gloria Swanson was the biggest star DeMille created. DeMille always did everything in the grand fashion. There was no other director like him in the world. He was a fascinating man, brilliant man. Um, you felt his presence before he came in a room. DeMille loved to find an excuse for a historical flashback. Male and female was about shipwrecked British aristocrats, yet DeMille took his characters to ancient Babylon. Swanson had to enter a lion's den. So down into this thing we go, and Mr. DeMille with a gun, revolver in his hand, no one else but the two trainers. And they bring out this fuzzy lion, and they claim he's a nice, Lion. Only two weeks after we had done this scene did he almost kill someone. At any rate, we didn't know that then. Mr. DeMille, of course, is back for the camera, and I look up, and here's my father in uniform. He'd come back from the war looking at his one and only, with his eyes popping out of his head, what's going to happen if something happens, and looking at DeMille with his gun. And at that, they said, you know, ready camera. Now, to make the lion roar, the two trainers are lashing him with their whips, and he's roaring. Now, let me tell you the sensation. When you can't look at danger and your eyes are closed, and here he is with his paws, wait, on the back of my bare back, because I'm bare to the waist. His hot breath, my, if I had any fuzz in my body at all, it was all standing right smack up. My heart, I don't know what it was doing. Then when he roared, it was like thousands of vibrators all over you. And then to go to the opening of the picture and have somebody sitting behind me and say, I wonder which one is stuffed. The most glamorous women were placed by DeMille in the most exotic settings. You gotta remember at the time, America was a fairly rural country. There was a lot of the country that had no indoor plumbing, no electricity. This was a way of living that, that few people had imagined, let alone seen. They were really something. The idea of a marble bathtub or marble floor or huge, luxurious towels. and He changed bathroom styles all over the world. 
people started making these wonderful sinks and bathtubs for, for people to buy. He did the same thing with fashion. Gloria Swanson changed fashion throughout the world. The milled stars were clothed by designers imported from Paris. He glamorized products. A bottle of perfume in a DeMille picture caused sales to soar overnight. To outdo himself, DeMille had to exaggerate more and more. DeMille's own lifestyle was far from opulent, although on DeMille Drive, his house was as impressive as any owned by a leader of industry, and a leader of industry is what DeMille was. In those early years, DeMille was much more than a motion picture director in that he would discuss salaries, he would be discussing the future of the studio, what kind of image its films should portray to the world. And in fact, in the early 1920s, DeMille, in fact, became a bank officer with the Bank of Italy, which very soon became the Bank of America and was one of its first loan officers to the motion picture industry. As to Los Angeles society, DeMille always cultivated that side because it was very useful to him. I mean, he knew bankers, he, he knew society, his, his daughter was blue book, social register, that sort of thing. DeMille had married, when he was 21, the daughter of a judge, Constance Adams. They had a daughter, Cecilia, and shortly after adopted two other children. DeMille seemed just the kind of person the founding fathers of Hollywood had hoped for, a firm believer in Christian values. Cecil B. DeMille was a mixed character. He was like a split personality. He was benign at home. He was a doting grandfather and father. He was a fairly reliable husband, although he had women on the side. But he had a crew of very devoted women. They all worked for him. And he had what amounted to a sort of a, a harem. They all adored him. And they would go through fire and water for that man. I don't think it's any secret that DeMille had um, women friends. Very few. Grandmother, when she had my mother, was told by the doctors that if she had another child, she would probably die. He couldn't have lived with only his wife because she was, she gave up sex. And uh, uh, he didn't want to do that. And uh, so there were, the question was, were they going to have a divorce or were they going to have an arrangement? He broke one commandment to keep another. Since he had uh, a, a duty in religion to stay with his wife, uh, he, he was compromised by breaking a, a different commandment and having a mistress. On the right, Jeannie McPherson, DeMille's regular writer and mistress. She wrote, with him, the vast proportion of his silent films. DeMille's own experiences gave a rare insight to his films of marital life, but his private life, if somewhat unorthodox, was nothing compared to the scandals that would rock Hollywood. In the center, Wallace Reed, Paramount's biggest star, who would suddenly die of drug addiction. And there was worse to come. Comedian Roscoe Arbuckle, accused of rape and murder. A scandal reverberated around the world. While the Arbuckle trial continued, a leading director was murdered. In an America where even alcohol was illegal, what fate awaited the movies? And all the scandals revolved around employees of Paramount. On top of these, the DeMilles faced a scandal of their own when they adopted a fourth child. As the baby grew up, he began to look more and more like the DeMille family, and people said, aha, uh, DeMille had a baby. We don't know who the mother is. Uh, but uh, this is how he covered it up. And after a while, people just accepted that I was Cecil's son and nobody knew who my mother was. 
I always felt as though I were something of a guest in a, in, in a house oh, where the father figure was a really great guy that I really liked a lot. And I became very attached to him. The years went by. My Uncle William died. And my father, Cecil, called me in and said, I want to tell you about your parents. Your father was your Uncle William. Your mother was a writer. And here is a book she wrote. DeMille had successfully averted a scandal at the risk of his own reputation. But the public was still critical of Hollywood morals. DeMille decided that if they wanted sermons, he would give them sermons, fully illustrated. In Manslaughter, he compared the morals of modern youth to orgies in ancient Rome. I think he was filming his own daydreams. He really did like voluptuous young women. He really did like them all rolling around in these beds. And he had been raised differently, and his wife had, Constance Adams. And he'd come of quite a different background. He didn't have it himself. But I think he dallied in the thoughts of it and thought it was enormously attractive. I think it's extraordinary, but then I'm not a man, you see. I don't know, maybe men like that sort of thing. Women rolling around bulls. Cecil made these pictures that oftentimes the critics scorned, but were huge, huge successes. Criticism from movie critics, uh, which was not favorable, <clears throat> he rejected. Uh, he just didn't like it. and. Uh, said he was making a movie not for the critics, but for the people. No matter who played in his pictures, DeMille was the real star. Publicity for his films focused more on DeMille than the story. By the early 20s, he was one of the biggest attractions at the box office. Cecil, you see, put on such a figure as big director, big producer, he was always one of the three musketeers. He was always appearing at the King's Court. Cecil had been a swashbuckling actor. Everything he did was the grand manner. DeMille's flamboyance derived from David Belasco, the impresario he had worked with on Broadway. I think that uh, one thing he learned from Belasco was the managerial tantrum. Uh, Belasco used to uh, blow up on stage uh, at actors uh, to get their attention and make them do what he liked, and DeMille did the same thing. DeMille even modeled his office on Belasco's. Velasco had once taken credit for a play that DeMille had written for him. DeMille had never forgotten. And I think Cecil's revenge was just to take the entire image out to Hollywood and do it better out there. It had vaulted beams like a church, and it had bare rugs on the floor and a light that was fixed on the victim, I was about to say, the interviewee, and made him very uncomfortable while the mastermind sat back in the shadows and studied. I just think DeMille loved being DeMille. I think he loved being DeMille more than he loved anything else in his creative professional life. And I think he did not want to disappoint his audiences. He knew who they were, so he was consistent for his audience in making the quintessential DeMille picture and repeating himself again and again. But I think he, 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 he certainly had much more of a grasp of who he was as a filmmaker than I have about who I am as a filmmaker. I'm still struggling and searching, and everything to me is a new unknown you know, opportunity or challenge. But I think DeMille pretty much knew what he was doing. DeMille asked his audience to suggest the theme of his next film. 
Several people came up with the Ten Commandments. A gigantic cathedral is being built, but the construction boss has been cheating on materials. His mother pays an unexpected visit. But DeMille decided a modern parable wasn't enough. He added a spectacular biblical prologue with its design inspired by 19th century artists. My mother took me when I was a little boy through the Doré collection, which was then at the Metropolitan in New York. And I've never forgotten those canvases of Moses in the wilderness with the brazen serpent and the marvelous Doré compositions that are wonderful. DeMille poured Paramount's money into the rebuilding of ancient Egypt, hiring the best craftsmen and insisting on absolute authenticity. A tent city, Camp DeMille, took shape in the sands of central California, large enough for two and a half thousand extras Pat Moore played the pharaoh's son. I can only say that it was handled like clockwork. They had a bugler that would wake you up in the morning and another bugle when things were ready to go. The Northern California militia uh, were there doing a lot of the riding. They got a lot of the local farmers. But he said, I am going to do the exodus tomorrow and uh, I would like you and your mother to come up and, uh, and see how we're doing it. So of course, we, my mother jumped in, so did I. I thought, well, this is great. I'd love to see it. The Israelites started coming out of the temple and from the sides with flocks of sheep, goats, camels, and... Um, all their paraphernalia that they had, there were literally thousands of them. And he said, you know, you and your mother will remember this scene for the rest of your lives. The head of Paramount feared that the runaway costs would ruin the company. And Zucker was outraged at this. He saw the whole company being brought down by this profligate director. At one point, DeMille offered to buy the negative back from the studio. And Frank Garbutt, a Paramount executive, intervened with Zucker and said, don't sell what you haven't seen. <laughs> Zuko's fears were unfounded. The Ten Commandments made a fortune. It became one of the landmark films that propelled Hollywood into its golden age. Paramount, with hits like this to its name, was able to expand its studio. But the specter of the budget on the Ten Commandments would come back to haunt DeMille. A favorite project was The Sorrows of Satan, Zucker cancelled the project, and when he restarted it, 
it would be with D.W. Griffith. By then, Zuko's lack of vision had caused DeMille to leave in disgust. Zucker called Cecil in and said, Cecil, we've never considered you one of us. When he told that story, he, uh, he had a tear in his eye. It, it was a crushing blow that Zucker said that to him. He bought this enormous studio, a contrast to the barn where he began. The opening ceremony was attended by important producers like Joseph Skenk and Louis B. Mayer, the very men he intended to challenge. Besides directing his own films, he planned to supervise 25 program pictures a year. But the most important film he would make for his studio was The King of Kings. To depict Christ on the screen was hazardous and was forbidden, for instance, by the British censor. DeMille entrusted the role to a dignified character actor called H.B. Warner. And many people, it's their, their vision of Jesus is based on H.B. Warner and the King of Kings. The King of Kings is a picture that has been seen, it's been estimated by more people than any film ever made. It's been in constant distribution since 1927. Well, my, my father used to read the Bible to us boys every, every night, a chapter of the Old Testament, a chapter of the New Testament, and a chapter of history. And those characters became very real to us. And the, the, I won't say the stories of the Bible, but the great events of the Bible became real as they are real. We shot a lot of the King of Kings up at his house, but he had the olive trees around the house and a feeling even there that there, you could go into his garden and it was exactly what would be called for in the, in the biblical picture. And the place was, if you stop to think of it, a sort of Mount of Olives. DeMille thought of it, and he brought his crew and his actors up there to film Jesus Christ walking in our garden. DeMille's religiosity was a sort of a dramatic, I don't want to call it a pose because he really was a true believer, but he learned it from his father who was a preacher and an actor. And so religion and acting were almost one thing. Of all the films DeMille ever made, The King of Kings was the most important to him and the closest to his heart. Now he was an independent, the film was a tremendous gamble. To transfer the Bible to the screen, said DeMille, you cannot cheat, you must believe. They were filming the, the crosses, the crucifixion, on Christmas Eve. And when they wrapped the scene, people started to leave. And it was very beautiful, those three crosses on top of that mount. And Grandfather called them back for a moment to reflect. And a few people started to kneel. And then they all knelt. And they said a silent prayer. It was, Grandfather said, a very very beautiful moment. The King of Kings made it seem as if the Jews had killed Christ and Jewish organizations were outraged. DeMille had to re-edit and lay the blame on just one character. All of which was odd because DeMille had a strong Jewish connection. The mother was a British Jewess and some of us have inherited some of her, her features but Cecil didn't like it. And he always told me, for instance, I never could be photographed because I had the Jewish nose, you see. DeMille was brought up a Protestant, his mother having converted when she married, but he didn't think of himself as belonging to any particular church. He went into churches. That's not the same thing as going to church. He went into churches when they were empty, and he sat in them for a long time by himself. The picture was a massive success. DeMille donated his profits to charity. He had invited D.W. Griffith to work for the studio. Griffith too had been abandoned by Paramount. He declined, but called the picture a marvelous achievement. DeMille would still be dealing with theater as a showman, 
I think Griffith tried to do more. I think Griffith uh, was a revolutionary. That was a different thing. Griffith was finding a new way of telling, new way of communication. It's interesting to compare the two. He was definitely more revolutionary, but he stopped making films, and DeMille continued. The Godless Girl was the most controversial subject DeMille ever put on film. A savage indictment of reform schools, each research had taken eight months, and every incident was based on fact. Some reform schools used instruments of torture associated with the concentration camps of a decade later. Fire breaks out, and the inmates sabotage attempts to extinguish it. The heroine has been chained up in solitary confinement. The Mill's studio was in severe trouble. Hardly any of its films made money, and The Godless Girl was held back. The fundamental nature of the medium had changed. Talking pictures had arrived. De Mill lost his studio and had to move his operation elsewhere. All right, everybody quiet, please. He was rescued by MGM, whose motto was art for art's sake. But here, the director took second place to the producer. Of these top flight directors filmed in 1925, more than half had resigned or been fired by the time DeMille arrived in 1928. On top of all that, there was the problem of DeMille's first sound film. Sit down. He had to contend with a medium where action and pace took second place to dialogue. This was the first all-talking picture made only the previous year which now looks prehistoric. And the dicks will be there at 10 o'clock. Uh-huh. But they must not find Eddie. Don't you understand? What you mean... Take him for a ride. The moment uh, sound came in, everyone threw the technique of silent pictures away, swept mm -hmm. the stage clean, uh, swept everybody that had been working in silent pictures away and brought in uh, from the stage people who uh, were used to reading lines. And they put the camera in a little glass box. You couldn't pan it, you couldn't move it. It was in a glass room. And I took the camera out of the glass room and mm -hmm. put it on the stage to say, to try and bring back, and this sound engineer walked off. DeMille was able to bring back the mobility of silent films while still managing to record dialogue and effects live. Three sounds run together in this scene of a prison wedding taking place as the gallows are built for the groom. Wilt thou obey him and serve him, love, honor, and keep him in sickness and in health? 
and forsaking all others, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live. Dynamite made money, but his next did not. For his third film, he fell back on what had worked before and directed a sound version of The Score Man. It too flopped. His contract was not renewed. He uh, really caused a lot of problems. He was always late in the morning. He uh, uh, never came on the set until uh, at least 30 or 40 minutes after everybody else was there. And uh, his product uh, was uh, not up to the standard of MGM. To be dropped by Hollywood's top studio was humiliating in the extreme. I went round all the companies, said DeMille, but nobody would even listen. I was through. I was dead. For the years that you had done, done big things, nothing. You were completely dirt. As he drove around Hollywood, everywhere he looked were reminders of his days of glory. The DeMille studio, symbol of his brave try at independence. Grauman's Chinese, which had opened with the King of Kings. He set off for Europe from New York City, where his dreams of surpassing Belasco must have seemed bitterly ironic. Yet his most successful years were still to come. American Epic concludes tomorrow afternoon starting at 20 past one here on More 4. And next today, a chance to see the godless girl in its full restored glory. Join us after the break. <laughs>